were just discussing that uh, having some technical difficulties uh, while we're doing a digital media and digital ministry presentation is probably uh, not just ironic but appropriate uh, because it happens all the time in the real world. So uh, let's begin with a prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious and holy God, we come together this day to continue to live into who you call us to be. Gracious God, we thank you for all of the persons who are joining with us today on the live feed, on the videotape later, here in person, and on Twitter. We thank you, O oh God, for the ways that you have called us to live into this new day of ministry. Help us to be, for you, the church that we can be in this new age. And help us always to know that you are with us in all that we attempt to do. Stretch us, O oh God, this day and always. Amen. Amen. One of my colleagues and friends is Dr. Leonard Sweet. He talks about the binary of Googlers and Gutenbergers, right? Googlers and Gutenbergers. It is the difference between folks who are people of the book and folks who are people of the screen. Some folks talk about that binary as being digital natives or digital immigrants. Folks who were born into the digital age are screen folks, Googlers. They're digital natives. Many of us are not. We were born a little bit later, and we have become digital immigrants into a new age. What Pastor Keith Anderson does in his ministry is he bridges for pastors, preachers, lay folks, and others both in and outside the church. This divide that can be bridged with ministry that is open to both Googlers and Goog uh, Gutenbergers, right? For folks who are natives and folks who are immigrants. Reverend Keith Anderson received his STM from LTSP in 2002. Yay! He is the pastor at Upper Dublin Lutheran Church in Ambler. He is the author of the soon-to-be-released The Digital Cathedral Networked Ministry in a Wireless World. He also is the co-author with Elizabeth Drescher of the book Click to Save the Digital Ministry Bible, which I have already used as a textbook in two of my classes. Pastor Anderson came to Upper Dublin in 2012 after serving the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in Woburn, Massachusetts for nine years. He is working right now uh, with the New Media Project and has been traveling extensively helping the church see where we might be in this new media age. He has appeared both on the Huffington Post and Religion Dispatches. He is a speaker of great renown, has been moving around in our country and around the church, helping folks understand these issues. But he also just is a local church pastor who loves what he does and is doing ministry, uh, doing ministry in a lot of innovative ways. He is part of a weekly God on Tap conversations that happen at the intersections of faith and life held at a brew pub in Ambler. And just recently, this group spawned a new fundraiser, Brewing for the Greater Good, which raised $3,000 for a community cupboard. There are a lot of amazing things happening in ministry, particularly in digital, digital ministry, and we are delighted to have Pastor Anderson with us today. I want to tell you about two things that are happening. One, we are going to be live tweeting the event, and so the hashtag is up at the top of the screen here. It's hashtag LTSP Convo. If you have questions uh, at the end of Pastor Anderson's uh, presentation, we're going to be receiving those both by Twitter and in person, so please uh, just think of things that you want to share. But first, let's welcome Pastor Anderson to come and share with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
It's great to be here. Thank you, Professor Wiseman and President Lowe's and Dean Sebastian and Professor Grafton. Um, when I approached David, who's a member at our church at UDLC, I uh, said, do you think there might be an opportunity to share some of the stuff I've been working on with the book? I really never expected all of this. Um, so thank you for making this space. Uh, thank you to LTSP for supporting me in my ministry preparation. I really um, had such a profound experience here uh, during my Lutheran year STM. And uh, in my parish ministry and in my speaking and writing, I especially especially grateful for this opportunity to share what I've been working on over the last year and I suppose years thinking about uh, digital ministry and how we uh, build community and share the gospel uh, and lead in a digital age. Uh, I'm grateful that we have um, people here in the room and people on Twitter and watching the live stream. I know at the very least my mom and my stepdad are watching. So <laughs> hi mom and Ray. Uh, we're taking questions and comments at the hashtag LTSP convo. Uh, and in my mom's case, you can just call me later. Um, I probably have uh, way too much material to cover in the time allotted, so um, I'll move through it pretty quickly, and so let's uh, jump in. Uh, it goes without saying that we are uh, living in a time of rapid change and that the field of ministry practice uh, has changed dramatically within recent years. Normal, enormous cultural shifts uh, the end of American civic religion, uh, common perceptions and portrayals of Christianity and Christians, uh, detailed extensively by the Barna Group. Um, congregations are looking at changing family configurations, uh, multi-generational multi nature uh, of church now, having six generations uh, at one time in our congregations, so from youngers to middles to olders to six distinct generations with distinct experiences and distinct needs. Uh, we have a more diverse culture than ever, a more transitory culture than ever. Um, and the two things that I've been concerning myself with uh, in my parish work and in my writing is the development uh, and acceleration of internet, social media, and mobile technologies, uh, and the rise of the nuns, that is, the religiously unaffiliated. So if you were to ask them what their religious affiliation would be, it would be they check the box, none of the above. Um, so today we find ourselves living in what I would describe as a digitally integrated and spiritually distributed world. Uh, first, digitally integrated. Uh, we are living through what Barry Wellman and Lee Rainey call in their very helpful book, Networked, uh, what they call the triple revolution of the internet, social media, and mobile technology, uh, which has been a trend for over about the last 25 years, but we see uh, moving so quickly um, even in the last few. Uh, and these technologies have become embedded in our everyday lives. Um, and so Pew Research has done a wonderful job of tracking the ways in which uh, um, American adults are using technology, um, internet, social media, and mobile devices. Um, some of those statistics are that 87% of American adult adults are online. 71% uh, access the internet daily, 68% connect through a mobile device, which is really noteworthy. 71% of adults who are online are on Facebook. That represents 56% of the entire U.S. population that's on Facebook. Um, and after Facebook, there's a big drop off to LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, and Twitter, all of which hover around that 28 to 23%. Um, I think really notably in the latest Pew Research um, at the end of 2014, uh, they say 52% of people are on two or more social media networks. That's up 10% from the previous year. Um, so what it says to me is that <coughs> we by and large are getting Facebook figured out and how that works and people are feeling more confident, more fluent in social media technologies so they're branching out you know, into other things, whether they're, it's LinkedIn for their business networking, um, Instagram and Pinterest for visual um, media sharing, uh, or Twitter. But we're getting uh, better and better at navigating the social media connected world. Um, and we're also doing it on our digital vice the devices. So 89% of Americans now carry a cell phone. 58% um, of American adults use a smartphone, which is a pretty remarkable number. Um, and you can see here the way that people use those technologies. So 81% text, 60% access the internet, 50% download apps, 49% use GPS, get recommendations, location-based information, 
48% listen to music, 41% watch video, 40% record video. Um, and so these technologies um, in this triple revolution, um, technology revolution, have really become integrated and embedded in our daily lives. You know, we no, no longer walk across the house or across the room or across campus to go to the computer lab to dial into our modems um, and access the internet. Now everything is delivered right to our pockets and, uh, and even to our to our watches now. Just think about the way that we access music and listen to music. You know, the news this week was that Starbucks finally stopped carrying CDs, which seems long overdue. Um, though at the same time, they, they have been handing out little cards that give you a free app of the day or a free song of the day, where you get like the sweetener and the chocolate that you sprinkle on your lattes. Um, and so they've been doing that for a long time, so they've sort of been bridging the two. But now a lot of people discover music, you know, not by the music store or even buying it on iTunes, but streaming services like Pandora or Spotify. Think about the way that we access television now. Uh, we're not all sitting down at the same time, same time of the week, and watching Seinfeld. Um, we're binge watching on Netflix now or Amazon Prime or whatever your platform is. This week, all the rage has been people uh, binge watching House of Cards on Netflix because the entire new season has been released at one time. It's a very different way, very different communal experience of engaging media. Um, so we're digitally integrated in ways that even a few years ago, I'm not sure that we could have um, appreciated or anticipated. We're also much more, therefore, spiritually distributed. Um, the Pew Research Report came out uh, last year talking about the ways that people share their faith online. Uh, and their findings were that 20% of Americans have shared their faith online and that fully 46% of Americans have seen someone else share their faith online. Um, that 46% seems like to be a re remarkable number. Um, so the social media space, um, I think, early on was considered this kind of very secular, non-religious, non-spiritual kind of virtual cyber place to be. It turns out that people are sharing um, their faith. They're talking about religious issues and news. When Elizabeth and I wrote Click to Save, um, one of the articles we had cited was uh, a New York Times article about a page called Jesus Daily on Facebook, uh, which had topped out, was the highest had the highest level of engagement on Facebook, beating Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber. And at the time we wrote that, it was pretty amazing. They had 8 million followers. Now they have 25 million followers. Uh, and from what I hear, that spawned a book, and from what I hear is um, uh, they're looking to do a video series almost akin to Netflix. When you have 25 million subscribers, you want to provide some, some kind of content, engage people around that. Um, but Elizabeth and I have argued in, in the Narthex that um, sometimes uh, we can approach the way we share faith in an online space very narrowly as if faith or the gospel were a piece of content or a piece of information. Um, and we ask the question, well, what about uh, the kind of relational connections um, that are ongoing, the care and the concern, which is hard to quantify, uh, but which is very important and probably um, the majority of ways that we engage faith online. Uh, and Elizabeth asked the question, you know, what if I do this? Um, does anybody know what this is? Um, this is one of the, th this is hugs. It's hugs. So if somebody puts a uh, you know, request for care, concern on Twitter or Facebook, oftentimes you'll see something like this, uh, the parentheses put together in such a way, uh, and that's meant to denote hugs. You know, well, does Pew count that as a piece of uh, way of sharing your faith, or is it an expression of faith? Um, so in some ways, that 20%, 46%, we would argue, is probably much broader, um, though admittedly harder to quantify. Uh, relatedly, of course, we're dealing in a, we're living in a time where we see the rise of the nuns, um, and conversation about the nuns was popularized in the 2012 Pew Report, uh, Nuns on the Rise, which reported that 20% of Americans uh, don't claim a religious affiliation, 30% uh, of people under 30 are unaffiliated, and that that rate of religious unaffiliation, which has been increasing for like the last 25 years, <laughs> increases by about 20% year over year. Um, and nuns are not just sometimes we think of um, this kind of prototypical millennial nun. Um, nuns cross the board in terms of age and experience and backgrounds. And the majority of nuns are actually formed in our congregations. As Elizabeth likes to say, sometimes our congregations uh, operate as nun factories. Um, we produce them at astonishing rates. Um, um, 
just this past week, the P Public Religion Research Institute um, uh, via the Washington Post published numbers uh, about religious affiliation in the country. It's a set of uh, maps which are well worth looking. I'm just posting the unaffiliated map now. And it breaks down the percentage of an unaffiliated by state. Uh, you can see here in Pennsylvania, we're at 19. My old stomping grounds in Massachusetts um, was 22. And I can tell you there's a big difference between 22 and 19. Um, when you move from Massachusetts to Pennsylvania, you are church-going people. Um, and, and I suppose also part of that is that uh, for Lutherans in New England, there are about as many Lutheran congregations in the five states of New, uh, of New England and Upper New York as there are in all of Southeast Pennsylvania. So there is this kind of cultural and civic um, support for being Lutheran, like actually people have heard of it, um, as opposed to Massachusetts, when you say you're Lutheran, they say, you mean Lithuanian? Um, <laughs> So, uh, so we're living in, a, in, a, in an environment where uh, far, far less can be taken for granted about what people know about what it means to be a Lutheran Christian and what it means to be a church. And the image I keep coming back to again and again um, is this image that was posted by NBC News um, uh, in 2013 the, at the announcement of Pope Francis, the introduction of Pope Francis after he had been elected by the College of Cardinals. Um, the upper picture is from 2005, and that's the funeral of Pope John Paul II. Um, and this Instagram picture, of course, <laughs> was meant to depict the ways in which technology has changed. So in the, the upper picture, you can see there's a guy at the bottom right corner with a flip phone. And at that point, 2005, he's an early adopter. I think there's somebody in the other far left bottom corner that has a, has a small phone as well. And look at the massive difference between just in those eight years between uh, 2005 and 2013. And remember in 2005, Facebook was, was a year old, but it was only available to people who had certain college email addresses. Now colleges don't even give out email addresses anymore. Um, and then in, in, um, and in the iPhone came out in 2007, so that was two years. And that really represented, although there were smartphones, the popularization of the smartphone. So this shift has happened dramatically, not only in technology, but the ways in which we share and tell the stories of faith um, and engage religious questions online. So people here in 2013 in St. Peter's Square are gathered around a religious event and they're telling the story of a religious event. Um, and so we're, we're not just relying on the radio and the news and the newspaper to tell us the story, they're telling the story, they're shaping the story. Whether it's factual and news-driven for them, a curiosity, or it's a, part, a core part of their faith. Um, and so we are digitally integrated and we are spiritually distributed. That uh, faith is engaged across these digital platforms um, and in local platforms as well. Now, the nuns, uh, I fear, has become a code word um, among church insiders for church decline and everything that seems to be wrong and going against the church's way. Um, the nuns is this source of all manner of hang, ha hand wringing and lament. Um, the moniker of nun in and of itself is problematic because it infers an absence, a lack of, um, an otherness. Um, when in fact, nuns practice and believe and make meaning um, in profound ways. So one of the interviews I did among many for the book uh, was an interview with Dean Steve Thomason, who is the Dean of St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral in Seattle, which in fact draws hundreds of people and many nuns to their weekly Compline service, which has been going on since the mid-1950s, um, which is a remarkable feat for any church, but especially remarkable given, um, you'll remember that the Pacific Northwest was given this moniker of the nun zone in the 1990s, um, and still they're drawing uh, amazing number of people through their Compline service. And so this is what he kind of said about that nun zone idea. He said, the nun zone is really an, an overstated theory it isn't to suggest that people are flocking to churches here, but they are deeply, deeply desirous of an experience with the divine. They are not people without faith. They may be people without faith communities that are named as such. Uh, further, he went on to describe that Compline service to me, and he said, you know, in the, glow, in the midst of this darkened cathedral sanctuary, he said, there's this glow of ambient light that uh, comes up from the pews, that comes from all the smartphones that are out during the Compline service. 
And he says the experience of that service is exactly parallel to what happens in coffee shops on every corner here in the Northwest, he says. You go in on a Saturday morning or a weeknight and folks are just sitting there. They may be on their cell phone, they may be on their computer, they may be talking to a friend, but there's this kind of communal sense of presence in that place. That same sense of communal presence that he finds uh, in the Compline service and that I would argue in the book we find in local and digital gathering spaces and traditional religious gathering spaces as well. Uh, for many people, um, that Compline service, which is very open um, and requires nothing of you except to let be and to be in that space, uh, it is for many people, they've tracked over the years, an entry point into the cathedral uh, congregation and community, though that is not um, the intent. The intent is to hold the space for people of a range of beliefs. Um, and so the rise of the nuns, which we all talk about fearfully, I think does not just indicate a retreat from religious institutions, it represents a changing patterns of spiritual and religious practice, the changing contours of American Christianity. Um, in Elizabeth Drescher's forthcoming books with uh, Oxford University Press, Choosing Our Religion, The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns, which comes out this summer, will be a great resource to ministry leaders. Um, the church needs to move beyond the sense of fear and lament around nuns um, and to recognize that what this is is a shift in observance and practice of religion and spirituality itself. The question is not, why don't they like us? But instead, how is religious practice and belief changing? Where is it happening, much of it online? And how do we participate in that? And what is the networked character, whether it's happening online or off, uh, of American spirituality? Uh, and in another Pew study, they track this trend among millennials, but also across generations, that people are moving from institutions in, to networks. So they track it in the religious sphere, the po political sphere, and even the practice of marriage, saying uh, millennials, but every generation on its own in particular, um, is moving from uh, less uh, membership-based institutions to more of uh, networked connections. So how do we participate in those networks? How do we create those networks? How do we nurture um, those networks? Um, and so maybe the nuns are not so much other as we think. Uh, and I find that true to be true in my own parish experiences. You know, every time I've gone to set out to reach, you know, create a program that's gonna reach this prototypical millennial nun, you know, what I find is that my church people keep showing up. Whether it's a living room church, whether it's a YouTube two minute Bible study, if it's a theology pub, it's coffee shop office hours, what always happens is my church people come out over and over and again at two different congregations. And what that has shown me is that so much of our longings are the same. Um, but this isn't a phenomenon that's just about the nuns, um, but about all of us um, and how we practice our faith. And so my book, The Digital Cathedral, is a response to these changes, changing patterns of religious belief and the shifting field of faith and ministry practice. Uh, it is a call to a more expansive way of being church in a time when our definitions have become all too narrow. In the face of decline, we have closed in on ourselves uh, in an understandable and yet misguided attempt at self-preservation. Now more than ever, we need to imagine a church belonging, spiritual practice, and faith formation much, much more broadly than we have. And so I say in the book, the, <clears throat> the digital cathedral is an invitation to a more expansive understanding of church and ways of being church at a time when our definitions of church have become too narrow, too parochial. When evangelism is reduced to membership, faith formation is narrow to Sunday morning education classes, and sharing the gospel has been reduced to marketing rather than sharing the free and abundant grace and love of God. This more expansive understanding encompasses a range of people, practices, and beliefs. It takes seriously our digitally integrated lives, where what has been called the triple revolution of the internet, mobile devices, and digital social media is revolutionizing the way we lead our lives and live out our faith. So ministry in a digital age, then, is not just about how we use these social media platforms to broadcast out our church messages, as if a great Facebook page is going to save your church. Um, it is important to understand and to know these platforms, and Elizabeth Drescher and I um, describe what we see as faithful uses of these media in our book, Click to Save. However, 
It's really primarily about how we are connected, networked, how we listen and cultivate relationships, how we discover common ground, extend care, concern, prayer, and God's love, and how we bridge those connections between our screens and the face-to-face, -face. how we understand the sources of our authority, the meaningful participation in networks, and living and leading with authenticity, understanding and fulfilling our particular place, you might even say our calling uh, with um, consistently and with continuity across these networks. And so for me, the question about how we do ministry in a digital age is, is not just about the digital technologies themselves or the devices, it is about a networked relational and incarnational leadership stance, which Elizabeth and I named in Click to Save and I developed more fully in the digital cathedral. It's about fully engaging the world, our, our digital social networks both reflect and also help to shape. So why cathedrals? Um, and why as a Lutheran would I choose to talk about cathedrals and use it as the central image of this project when we don't have any cathedrals? Um, well, I suppose in a way you could say that cathedrals were the cutting edge technologies of their time. Uh, and that is true and they still amaze. I love what Robert Scott, the renowned cathedral historian, he said, he said, Gothic cathedrals made the doable seem impossible. And when you stand in the midst of a cathedral, you understand why. But I really chose cathedrals because first, um, they are expansive and make room for a range of peoples, practices, and beliefs. Um, this is a picture of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Um, but this is how uh, one bishop, the Bishop of Norwich in England, described the day in the life of Norwich Cathedral. And you can see, uh, it's a little dark, but you can see some of that reflected in, in this. This is how he describes a, a scene, a day in the life. Children playing in the cloisters, Mothers chatting to each other, a couple eating sandwiches, visitors pushing prams, vergers rearranging chairs, people lighting candles, kneeling quietly, others simply gazing into space. One or two are engaged in animated discussion with a guide, others curious about what was ta taking place in the nave, still others walking past the event, a service for a nearby university, down the side aisle, seemingly oblivious to it. He says this, they did not make a community in themselves, but the cathedral was large enough to include them without asking them any questions or seeking from them any justification for being there. Spaciousness in a cathedral does have a liberating quality in our present age. What was regarded as likely to be forbidding is now a vehicle for letting be. And that's very much the case at the Compline service at St. Mark's in Seattle. In a great little book uh, written in 1919, um, the former Bishop of Massachusetts, William Lawrence, uh, describes his vision for what an American cathedral could be. It was probably progressive in 1919 and still in many ways seems progressive for our times. Uh, this is the image that he held out. He says, in a great and noble church, the worshiper feels a sense of freedom. He, though an unchurched pagan, today we might say none, can quietly enter and without committing himself to any form of religious faith, feel the sense of, et of the eternities. Therefore, he says, beneath the great arches of the cathedral may be kneeling side by side, men and women of many faiths and creeds, and the temple may become through worship a church of reconciliation. And I think that word reconciliation is so important um, for where we are at the moment. Uh, often we approach these digital spaces and, and digital platforms as tools for conversion. Um, and I think the invitation for us is to view them as platforms for reconciliation, for people who have been um, hurt by the church, who are alienated from the church, um, to be in relationship and conversation over time and to share the gospel in the context of that relationship <laughs> and to find ourselves reconciled to one another within this digital cathedral. Um, secondly, cathedrals are more than monumental buildings. They are networked and relational hubs, deeply connected with the peoples and neighborhoods of which they are a part. They are, as Elizabeth Drescher writes in the foreword, profoundly networked structures, reconfigured through geographical, historical, religious, and spiritual space. Um, and my point of reflection on this is this wonderful drawing from 1167 or thereabouts uh, called the Waterworks, Drawings, uh, the Waterworks Drawing of the Edwine Psalter, which comes from Canterbury Cathedral. Um, and this is a drawing of Canterbury Cathedral from around 1167 and it's actually the plumbing system. <laughs> so at the bottom of the picture here, it's, a, it's two pages that are set vertical, so it's easier to see. At the bottom, it displays um, where the water is piped 
into the cathedral precincts from outside uh, through the wall. Um, and it's sort of color coded. There's a green line that you could follow all the way to um, a water tower, which is in fact still on the side of Canterbury Cathedral today, though not used for the water system. Um, and from there, the water is pumped out uh, throughout the, um, the, the cathedral precincts. So in the cathedral precincts, there was a brewery, there was a bakery, there was an infirmary, there was the necessarium, which was the, the monks' latrines. Um, and so you had all these different parts that fell within the cathedral precincts and the waterworks connects them. And if you were looking at this with today's eyes, you might think, well, that looks like a lot like fiber optic cable. Um, the ways in which it visually portrays the networked nature of um, life within the cathedral precincts, which um, at that time was administered by a Benedictine um, order. Um, and you might go further with that. There are some really amazing rental records from um, Canterbury Cathedral around this time. Um, the monks at Canterbury were lords over about a half to a third of all the property in Canterbury, so not just the precincts, but the town, and they kept all their receipts from these rental records. Um, and so these rental records wind up telling the stories of everyday people who often, you know, by the distance of history kind of fall um, below our view. We think about the archbishops and the abbots and the master builders, but rarely do we think about the plumbers and the bakers and the doctors who are part of that. So there are these wonderful stories of, of a guy named Ingwelf, who was a plumber, who was employed by the cathedral and probably worked on uh, the waterworks. His wife Eldrith was a home brewer, made four times of his take home pay. Um, Faramin was a, a doctor um, and tended to monks in the infirmary, uh, but he also opened a hospital, hospital for leprous women in Canterbury. Um, and there was Godfrey the baker, who is my favorite, um, along with his co-workers Roger and Walter was one of the bakers in the cathedral precincts. Uh, and the story goes that one of his sons is said to have been healed by a rag dipped in the blood of Thomas Beckett, the murdered archbishop. Um, and so in church history in places uh, like Canterbury, we often talk about the big historic figures. Less often do we appreciate uh, the everyday people and their everyday lives um, that also helped to shape both physically and spiritually uh, the cathedral. Uh, this all became pretty, that's a, more of a detail. Um, Trinity College Library has this and they were gracious to let us use it for the book. Um, this became kind of more real for me when I visited St. John the Divine in Manhattan, which is the third largest church um, in all of Christendom. Um, and so it's a beautiful, expansive church, and expansive would be an understatement if you've ever been in St. John the Divine. It is mind-boggling large. But um, inspired by the waterworks drawing, I wanted to also get a sense of Morningside Heights, the neighborhood that surrounds the cathedral and that really grew up around the cathedral. So in addition to the two tours I took uh, and the noontime Eucharist, I walked around Morningside Heights, saw um, the hospital, the, the fire station, the Columbia students heading off to school, the homeless with their shopping carts at the edge of Morningside Park, um, a, a neighborhood fair that was happening just on a side street um, in Manhattan. And even in the tours, you know, inside the building, uh, all the stories in these tours kept pointing outside the building. Um, the, the famed Gustafino uh, tiles that are used in, in the building, in, in the, the massive dome, uh, to hold up the massive dome and the massive baptismal font down below. Um, those tiles appear all over New York in the Oyster Bar and Grand Central Station and other places. And one of the seven chapels that's behind the high altar at St. John the Divine, our, our tour guide said, you know, if this looks like a subway station, it's because the same people who were building the subway stations were building this chapel. And they used a lot of the same design and materials. Um, and so everything in the cathedral continually pointed out, out into the community. And so uh, the subway station and 110th Street still called Cathedral Parkway. Um, even, and if I recommend if you go, you stop by the Hungarian pastry shop, which is kind of, of a life-changing kind of bakery experience. Um, even at the Hungarian pastry shop where I stopped before I went to the cathedral, there were these wonderful murals of the spiritual and mystical, and this is one of them behind the glass door, main door to the pastry shop. It says agape and unconditional love. So like the first religious art I actually saw that day on my trip was not at the cathedral, but was across the street at the bakery. So our assumptions about where faith happens, where church happens, um, who belongs, I think has to be a much, much broader and much more integrated into our daily lives. Um, and that became real for me um, in a different way when I visited Humble Walk Lutheran Church, which was in, in the West End neighborhood of St. Paul, Minnesota. It's an ELCA mission start uh, that doesn't have a church building. Uh, when I called up with them, they were worshiping in the public park. 
Um, and this was the altar for the day with the Ikea cups for the grape juice and, and wine uh, and a plate that looked like it could come out of my grandmother's kitchen. Um, and, uh, during, and so in the month of July, they worship in the park. Right now on Sundays, they're worshiping at a Jewish retirement community, but they do theology pubs at a local pub and beer and hymn nights, which draw far more people than actually come to worship on a Sunday. Um, and they have Bible studies at a local cafe. And so in the course of that visit where I visited the park and had worship, and then I went to the pub to see where they did their theology pub nights, it just occurred to me that the whole West End neighborhood of St. Paul uh, had become their cathedral um, with uh, the coffee shop sort of toward the top right on uh, 7th Street West and the Shamrock where they have um, theology pub and, and so forth uh, at the bottom. Um, 7th Street is their nave and the ambulatories are all the side streets around it. They're making their, their neighborhood um, their cathedral. Uh, and so a quest the question that comes up for me then is, uh, what do we consider sacred space? Uh, is it the substantive sacred space um, that happens in our church buildings, or does sacred space break out all over the place? Uh, Jean Kildee writes, uh, how people organize themselves and behave within certain places and view those places with sacred importance. Space is sacralized by human actions and behavior, and certain spaces become sacred because people treat them differently from ordinary spaces. Sacredness is situational. Groups of believers create holy places by investing certain places or spaces with religious meaning and then acting upon those meanings. So we hold together this strong sense of place our congregations have. You know, my congregation's been in the same place for like 250 years and it's not going anywhere. Um, but we're also exploring the pub, pubs and the cafes and the neighborhood um, of which we are a part and have been for a long time. Um, so how do we think about this? Um, I thought about this when it was about four degrees at the Fort Washington SEPTA station uh, when we were doing Ashes to Go, which is the second year of doing Ashes to Go, which is where people offer the imposition of ashes at local transportation centers. Um, this started by a small ecumenical group in St. Louis and is sort of spread, it's much more popular with the Episcopalians, um, but we stole the idea. So this is our, my, me and our Congregational Deacon Fred Renegar, he's also the chair of the candidacy committee for the Synod, uh, offering ashes to go at 6.30 in the morning at four degrees. Um, and people would come through, and of course many people looked at us like we were insane. Uh, they said, you know, stay warm. Uh, but a lot of people came forward and received the imposition of ashes. Um, and time and again, these last two years that we've done it, the um, reception um, that people have to it is a sense of blessing. People feel blessed by that. You know, telling a complete stranger, remember that you're dust and to dust you shall return. And here's a little information about Lent in our church. You would think to be a little off-putting, but the, the, um, what you see on people's faces is a sense of blessing um, and that we have created or we have encountered sacred space here. Um, and I think this also goes for uh, digital spaces. Tim Snyder, um, who studied at Luther Seminary and is now a doctoral student at Boston University, did a study about um, the response on Twitter to the shootings at, uh, at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, and how people responded to, to that incident on Twitter. And, he followed, and they compiled all the information uh, and what he said was Twitter became a very sacred space. People were posting pictures of candles. Um, people were using hashtags like no words to express their speechlessness about what had happened. Um, and so he says, you know, our findings suggest that religious practice and faith may not be declining, but they are shifting in surprising and exciting ways. Uh, so there's a way in which Twitter became sacred space as people needed it, almost like in you know, these roadside shrines when there's an accident, people put all these put you know, stuffed animals and crosses and um, mementos into a place to mark that place as, as hallowed ground. That happens, can happen in digital spaces as well. Um, uh, one of the stories uh, that's very personal and dear is a story about um, our friend Sarah Dalzell and her, Dave, uh, her husband Dave Dalzell is a graduate of the seminary and is a pastor in New Hampshire. And Sarah was diagnosed some time ago with stomach cancer. And so, uh, a number of our friends, uh, particularly around a um, uh, network of people around Camp Calumet, the Lutheran camp in New England, decided that on the days that she received treatments, which used to be Fridays, uh, we would post pictures of Chuck Taylors, Chuck, like Chuck All-Stars, because when Sarah was a kid and she had to go to the hospital, she happened to be wearing Chuck Taylors, and um, she was so nervous about being there, but then the doctors and nurses chatted her up about her Chuck Taylors, um, and it kind of put her at ease, and she was associated these chucks with care. So every Friday, then, people would post pictures of themselves with chucks, 
uh, to tell Sarah on their Facebook pages, to tell Sarah that they were thinking of her, that they were praying for her, and using the hashtag sneakers for Sarah. And this is one of our friends who's praying with her chucks. Um, so these are places where sacred space happens. So every Friday, now it's Tuesdays, though she's in the hospital a lot more now, um, becomes holy ground. Facebook becomes holy ground. So what's at stake with this sense of, of sacred ground? What's theologically at stake? And um, being in a good Lutheran crowd, I'm glad I get to reflect on that a little bit. Um, for me, um, the connection here, uh, what's theologically at stake? Well, the gospel is always theologically at stake. Um, but for me, the kind of beating heart, theological beating heart for this book is really a Lutheran understanding of vocation. vocation. Um, and um, vocation, which we shorthand as the priesthood of all believers, but which sometimes gets reduced to lay people doing the things that the priests or the pastors don't want to do. Um, and just a reminder that that really came out of the, the Reformation uh, and the shift from you know, the highest calling being to be a monk or a nun or a priest uh, to, be, to, to people finding their, their highest calling in the, the work to which they've been called in their daily lives, whether it's a teacher or a parent, a cobbler, um, um, you know, whatever it might be. And uh, Charles Taylor writes about this in Sources of the Self. He says, you know, by denying any special form of life as a privileged locus of the sacred, the reformers were denying the very distinction between sacred and profane, and hence affirming their inner penetration. The denial of a special status to the monk was also an affirmation of ordinary life as more than profane, as itself hallowed and in no way second class. The repudiation of monasticism was a reaffirmation of lay life as a central focus for the fulfillment of God's purpose. Um, now, Taylor will go on to say that what the reformers did was to really kind of remove the, the divine in the sense of the mystical out, outside of society, and, um, and I'd recommend to you on that Ron Thiemann's great posthumously published book, uh, The Humble Sublime, um, where he takes Taylor to task on that and says it's, it's a profound misreading of Luther's own incarnational theology. Um, but I think a Lutheran understanding of vocation is much broader and deeper than I think we give it credit for. Uh, it's a ministry, it's about ministry and daily life, finding God, the holy, the divine, perhaps that's something more and deeper in our daily living. Um, you'll probably be familiar with that Luther quote about the, the holiness of changing diapers, uh, which became real for me when we had twins, which was our third and fourth children. Uh, so in a very short period of time, we doubled the number of our kids and we tripled the size of our family. And I can imagine Martin Luther thinking some days, God, it'd be great to go back to the monastery. <laughs> um, and so part of this journey for me is my own experience of a parent. Uh, my spiritual life used to be very much grounded in silent retreats at the monastery, but when I realized, um, when I saw that ultrasound of two babies, um, that that was not gonna be possible for a while, I had to push myself to say, how can I find God in the same way in my daily life? Um, not just in the monastery, not just perhaps even in a church building, but in changing diapers and being on the, on the carpet and playing with the kids, um, hosting play dates. Um, so how do we recognize the holy in our daily lives, both online and off? How do we recognize all of life as sacred ground? How do we find the sublime amidst the mundane? And how do we recognize and affirm the ways people are already making meaning and practicing their faith? Uh, and how do we then come alongside and participate with them? President Loos had talked about this in his book, Preaching at the Crossroads. Uh, he says, jobs, looking for a job, relationships, parenting, managing too many things at once, money, family, school relationships, hobbies, volunteering, the media, local current events, that is, the stuff that constitutes our daily lives often seems to be painfully absent from much of our preaching. And it's painfully absent from much of our ministry. Um, that I think uh, a lot of what we have done is to make the congregation life, and it's all its volunteer opportunities, the new monasticism. Um, that we send these signals to people that say, uh, your highest calling is actually to be on three committees at church. <laughs> God bless all those people. I love those people. Uh, um, but how do we help people see their highest calling as their parenting and the work, their daily work that they're called to? Um, and I think that's profoundly important when we think about these digital spaces. You know, what does is, what is a sense of vocation have to do with Facebook? Um, well, maybe your Instagram or Facebook or Twitter feed looks like this. Uh, you know, this is from like the last two days. How many people, how many friends you see posting food? Um, you know, this is just like two, this is less than like an hour's worth of food pictures. Or how many people do you see posting pictures of their pets? 
um, what, what people are sharing in these social media spaces that we critique because they're so mundane and they're so droll and so boring uh, and so repetitive is they're actually sharing their vocation. And I think because we're so focused on what's happening inside our church buildings and our ministries that we miss the ways in which they are doing ministry and living out their faith in their daily lives. And what social media gives us an opportunity to do is to see it if we can recognize it and to affirm it as living out their holy calling in the world. Um, uh, Elizabeth Drescher, in her new book, she published this in Religion Dispatches, but in her new book she talks uh, at greater length about it. She surveyed nuns and asked them, um, what are the ways on a monthly basis that you make meaning? And the things they identified, enjoying family, enjoying friends, enjoying pets, enjoying food, prayer, enjoying nature and music were at the top of the list. She said, okay, well, if you don't go to church, you're not connected to a faith community, you're not affiliated, you don't identify yourself in that way, what are the ways in which you make meaning? And these are the things that they identified, all things that are deeply rooted in daily life. Prayer is the only traditional spiritual practice and category that is listed among those. And she'll say in the book, and you know what? The categories that Christians or religiously affiliated people identify is not that different. These are the ways which the affiliated and the unaffiliated are making meaning in their daily lives. So how do we understand that? How do we participate in that and engage that? And how do we keep the gospel going through these different parts of people's lives, um, all of which converge in these digital spaces? How do we go about the work of reconciliation rather than conversion, perhaps even reconciling the various parts of our own lives? Um, so uh, just some, you know, some people that are doing this very well, St. Lydia's Dinner Church in Brooklyn um, organizes their entire um, worship service and really their community life around the meal. Um, so, so when you come to worship on Sunday night or Monday night, uh, the Eucharist is the meal that is shared together with the sermon and readings and song. Um, Shobi's Table, uh, which is a new Lutheran food truck church in, in the Twin Cities. Uh, people come and they get food at the food truck and they have a worship service on the sidewalk, which is um, very new, very beautiful ministry that they're doing there. Um, the idea of blessing pets, this is from our uh, annual blessing of the pet service in our outdoor chapel, but people do those in different ways. Uh, blessing of the pets. Uh, if we know that pets are like the third or the fourth way people make meaning in their lives, what are we doing to engage them around that? What are we doing to bless that? Um, or the blessing of the bicycles um, that people use to commute or for recreation. How are we seeing that and blessing that? Um, uh, um, one of my uh, favorite ministries that I learned about in the course of writing this was called a nun's life ministry, uh, which is headed off on the right by uh, one of my heroes, Julie Vieira, as a sister in the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Monroe, Michigan. Um, and she started A Nun's Life as a, sort of a radio podcast, radio, um, an internet uh, podcast or radio show to tell people about what it was like to be a nun. But what she discovered was that what people really wanted was to be connected to a nun because they respected that call to religious life. Um, and that they could share their joys and their concerns with her and that they could be heard and prayed for. She said, and this is repeated throughout the book, there are these aha moments for people. I thought I was gonna use this to broadcast about whatever it was that I wanted to broadcast about. And what I found this to be was a place of relationship and reconciliation. Uh, Ron Thiemann is a friend and um, uh, real loss, uh, that he, um, he passed, but his work uh, is preserved in the humble sublime. He says, uh, you know, those who believe that in Christ, God, in Christ, God has brought about life out of death, hope out of sorrow, love out of cruelty, are now called to see the world, and I might say digital spaces, uh, the everyday and the ordinary with new eyes, the eyes of faith, and to live lives of hope and love directed at the neighbor in need. To be sure this view undermines many of the safe distinctions that we've come to rely upon, particularly the distinction between the sacred and the secular but it seeks to replace those dichotomous categories with integral notions like incarnation and sacrament. In so doing, this view seeks to relocate the sacred not beyond, but within our everyday experience. And I think that's what we have the opportunity to engage with as we uh, do ministry uh, in these digital spaces and local gathering spaces as well.
Thank you, Keith. We appreciate that. We also want to say to those folks who came on late on the live feed, we will upload the entire video so that you'll be able to see the part that you missed later on. And we have a little bit of time for some question and answers. I'm going to start with a question that came in through Twitter. Uh, and this question is, how do we enter the digital game in our congregations by doing it well, not being too far behind, especially if our buildings are too old to be Wi-Fi capable? How do we do this well? I think we need to start with being present in those spaces. Um, sometimes we focus so much on the technology or the lack of technology in our buildings that we forget about the technologies we're holding in our hands, which are by and large uh, digitally connected. Um, so how? So keep showing up, you know, show up in these places as yourself, um, as your church. I think being personally um, connected is is much more effective than um, uh, being present in online spaces as a as an organization or a congregation. So I always find I could share the same thing on my church Facebook page and, and share the same thing on my Facebook profile. And I'll always get more interaction on my, my own personal Facebook profile because there are more people there and because you know who you're engaging with. Um, so, so a lot of this is about showing up, showing up in online spaces, showing up in local spaces, putting yourself in that space. And often the transformational thing happens is not necessarily all those millennial nuns are gonna start beating it down your door, but you're gonna envision your ministry and the way of sharing the gospel in a new way. Questions in the room? Yeah, So how would you define the difference between uh, somebody in 1970 who would have said, check the box Christian, but really was a secular Christian? Haven't been to church in years. Between that and what? No, not even seeing. Um, but between somebody then now who would identify themselves with, as a nun, are, are we just getting honest, or is there some difference? <laughs> yeah, I think I think in some ways we're getting honest. I think then maybe that's a shift in. This would be more, this is when I'd call on Elizabeth to respond to you uh, with her <laughs> knowing the data so well. But I think as part of that is that you were Christian by default in our country you know if the not you know you're a christian by default uh, and now i think we have more ways um, to describe what it is who it is we are even in the category of none elizabeth will give you two dozen different ways that people identify themselves uh, and so in terms of religious affiliation maybe, but also in other ways people are finding much more um, uh, complex um, ways to describe their own identity and experience Another question in the room. Does a student have a question? I, I just tweeted one to you. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a difference between the, the quality or the substance of content, whether, whether we're talking to people who uh, are none or are trying to engage uh, on a faith level versus the, uh, the lukewarm Christians who are already in the car. Um, do, we, do we need two personalities depending on who we're talking to, or is there a middle ground where we can talk to everyone from one, from one digital pulpit? Or yeah. Uh, I, my experience tends to be that when I'm trying to evangelize people outside my congregation, I wind up evangelizing people inside my congregation. Uh, and so sometimes the idea that uh, we're going to have two profiles, whether actual profiles or kind of you know imaginary profiles, I'm speaking to this group now, I'm speaking to that group now. Um, in fact, when we let that convergence happen, I think people evangelize each other and even people, you know, my favorite part on social media is when I get church members and colleagues and people who I know in my life that don't go to church all on the same comment thread. Um, and they're talking to each other about whatever it is that this means. Um, and that just, you know, from across the miles. Um, and so, um, kind of creating two different groups or three different groups or whatever it might be, I think uh, cuts down on the opportunities for those kind of points of connection. I've got another question from Twitter, and that is not only do we have a rise of the nuns right now, but it seems that we have a significant increase in digital activism right now. How can the church utilize that, make, uh, make uh, really substantial and important steps in increasing their digital activism? Um, that's a great question and, and very true. I was at the New Media Project, um, a conference on um, thinking theologically about social media and sharing the gospel, and one of the case studies that came up was Black Lives Matter. 
um, and how do we engage as the church around digital activism? Uh, and one of the big warnings was, um, well, don't try to co-opt it. <laughs> don't try to faithify it. Um, how do you, um, you know, see what's going on, participate without trying to co-opt it? Uh, either me as a white man trying to co-opt co it or as the church um, institution trying to co-opt it. So uh, a lot of this is about seeing what's happening and engaging with ha what's happening without trying to somehow then make it yours. Um, but there are lots of opportunities to connect with people around issues um, of common concern to people. Um, and we think about these larger movements that we uh, often see, but I'd also encourage you to think about what are the micro movements. Um, when I'm on Twitter, by and large, I'm connected to sort of a church and social media um, crowd that's thinking about these things. But it, in my two parish experiences, it's really been a way to connect with uh, what's happening in my local community. Um, so sometimes we think globally, um, what's happening in our neighborhood? What are the, the cares and concerns? How can we engage people beyond our existing networks, our existing church network, um, around some of these places of concern? Um, you know, not a very digital way, but I'll just say this event we had brewing for the greater good was an example um, of a brew pub, a congregation, and a restaurant coming together to raise money for a local food pantry. Um, and that was all about building relationships over time and over the course of that relationships, understanding that, in fact, Forest and Maine had supported the Maddie Dixon Food Cupboard previously, and our church had also supported the food cupboard. So there was a place of connection but you got to keep showing up enough for those stories to be told. Uh, and you got to listen long enough for people to share. Um, and then these points of collaboration can happen. I want to ask uh, President David Lowe's to come forward. He has just a couple of things he wants to say as we end today. Uh, I know we're, I want to be conscious of time, so just two things really briefly. In addition to a word of thanks for Keith to take this time and share his expertise and his journey with us, and to Karen and David and others for arranging this. But the two things, one is that I come at this um, from a really personal or even more selfish point of view. As a couple years ago, I realized, sitting with my kids in church, that more often than not, they were, quite frankly, bored out of their minds. And if that we didn't find another way to interact with them around questions about meaning and spirituality, they would not keep coming very long. Um, what I realized on further reflection that was often, when I was sitting with them, watching them be bored, I was a little bored too. <laughs> um, and I've thought about how, uh, how if we could find ways to engage them more fully in the life of faith, um, I might find that really interesting and engaging as well. And so I'm really happy to have this event and possibility and hope that it's not a one-off, but it really is starting us in thinking together about how social media invites us to think about how we're the body of Christ virtually. It's not going to replace our in-person gatherings, but it can augment and extend and invite us to do the things Christians have always been called to do, which is to comfort and console and encourage uh, and draw together people and community in Christ. So thanks, Keith, again, and thank you all for coming and those who are watching, and I hope it provokes us into deeper reflection.